Hello everyone, welcome to our session on transactional solutions for microservices. I'm Adam Ružička, I work for Red Hat, I'm a developer of the Foreman project and I program mostly in Ruby, although I've dabbled in all sorts of other languages. And if you want to take a look at what I do, there's my GitHub, go there, check it out. Over to you. Uh, I'm Ondra Chalopka. Uh, I as well work with Red Hat uh, on uh, Whitefly project, uh, more specifically on Narana Transaction Manager. And my uh, high links are as well mentioned here. All right, so what's on agenda for today? First, we'll take a look at transaction management, what it is, why do we want it. Then we'll take a look at microservices and how they fit together with transactions. We'll introduce the Saga pattern as one possible solution. And we'll take a look at two implementations of the Saga pattern, namely long running actions for microprofile and the Dunflow framework. First, what is a transaction? A transaction is an atomic unit of work where all the parts of it either finish or fail. So the transaction is either fully done or not done at all, nothing in between. It has just these two states. Let's take a look how transactions lo lo look like in you know, your everyday applications. So we'll start uh, a monolithic example application where we have uh, just uh, some uh, application receiving a call and doing some uh, updates to, to different databases. Uh, when we have such situation, we expect uh, the application needs to do several um, business tasks and could be like creating order, filling shipments, uh, saving the data to different database to be uh, to be received by some third party and sending confir confirmation there. So that we are we have th three actions, and right, but the system could crash. And now these three three uh, different uh, uh, steps are broken. So we would like to have some way of defining those applications as single unit of work, which are like coupled or are composed as, as uh, either all finishes or none of them. That's where a uh, transaction uh, manager uh, or, or transaction handling helps us. Uh, and normally that's uh, some third party or the third party um, service or other service than the application is which manages, uh, which guarantees that the, uh, the consistency for the data which are, uh, which compounds from those three uh, actions. So there is, here is the application, make some changes in database and then at the end it's up to the transaction manager to finish the, the old task uh, to, to fulfill the consistency to, to finish all with success or uh, with final. Then. Next, take a look. let's take a look at the same thing, but in a kind of microservice deployment. Uh, of course, microservice deployments come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So in this example, we have one gateway, which calls all the other microservices, which do the separate steps. Or we could, for example, don't have the gateway and let the microservices call each other. And what's happened then? Uh, there's, there's a problem that there is like a lot of parts that could crash now, much more than well, before? Well, one could say that we traded a single point of failure for many single points of failure. For that, people started to imp implement all kinds of frameworks and <coughs> experimental ideas, let's say. So to quote Martin Klepman on this, Every sufficiently large deployment of microservices contains an ad hoc, inter informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half of transactions. So, all right, so maybe we can just use the usual standard asset transactions uh, in uh, microservice world. 
but that uh, could be a trouble uh, for the microservices as a distributed system. Uh, normal transactions brings logs, which causing microservices being coupled together. Give me a, uh, a short time uh, to, to explain this. Normal tran normal transaction manager uh, uh, works uh, with uh, X8 transaction, which is specification to run two-phase commit over different uh, participants of the transactions. For example, here we have uh, like two applications uh, 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 inserting something to databases, then it's up to the uh, transaction manager to manage the, the completion. Uh, if we go so, then when I take just the one of these uh, applications and the one database, then we can see the transaction manager uh, uh, starting the transactions. This is the transaction started at the database. And when application invoke some insertion to database. The, uh, in the scope of this transaction, the insert is done. This is a kind of in-progress state, which is not visible to other, uh, other parallel running, uh, like queries or insertion. And uh, uh, at, at point when transaction manager started to run two-phase commit, because two-phase commit is like consensus uh, protocol to provide this consistency over multiple uh, participants in the transactions. It runs the prepare call as, as the first phase to the database. And this uh, database then logs the, uh, the row of which, uh, which is composed of, of that insertion. And at that time, other application which is, are somehow dependent on that on that record are uh, locked to be to be uh, to be processing. For example, here if there there is this book uh, book uh, book uh, book books, booking the some some title, then for example, if other service would like to cancel this booking, it's dependent on the first uh, first uh, insertion to finish till time when commit is called, then the lock is released and uh, the row is available for other participants to run uh, uh, any, any data changes. So now we are coupling the different operations based, uh, uh, different operation together, chaining them, which is maybe not what we want uh, in microservices. So to me this looks awfully a lot like uh, pick two out of three options where the three options are use microservices, the other option is use transactions, and the third thing is uh, to not have to implement these transactions ourselves. As we've seen, people tend to kind of drop the last point and pick the first two, and then implement the transaction handling themselves. So we've seen why uh, why transactions are a good thing and why we want them and why they don't really work out of the box for micro, uh, microservices. So we could always roll back to the monolithic approach, but we want to use microservices, right? We may want to do so because of small teams which are focused on one single functionality piece can develop and deliver it much faster. We also may want independence where we can pick the right technology to do the job and not be bound by a single language or framework for the entire application doing lots of different things. We also may have uh, scaling problems and we, want, we may want to address those by just scaling the service which has problems up. Also, microservices are usually easier to understand since they <coughs> reduce the scope a lot and deal with just one thing. And they also isolate failure in a way. A failure in 
one single service doesn't necessarily have to bring down the entire application. So we need some kind of a distributed domain transaction. Luckily for us, it already exists. It's called the Saga pattern. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So let's take a look at the picture. Uh, here we have, we could consider the entire thing a transaction. We want to book a trip. For that, we need to book a flight to get to some other country, let's say. Then we need a bus to get from the airport to a hotel. And then we need the hotel to book a place at the hotel itself. But these providers, let's say, don't have to have anything in common and implementing a traditional transaction could be difficult. So we need a way to manage failure and that's Saga pattern. Basically we attach to all these things a procedure how to undo the changes. So for example, if we book a flight and it goes well, we have a flight, okay. We try to book a bus, we get a bus ticket, it's fine. We try to book a hotel and it fails. The hotel is full, let's say. And we need a way to you know, make the whole thing appear as if nothing ever happened. So we need to cancel the, the bus ticket and we need to cancel the flight booking. And Saga pattern handles that for <laughs> us. It tracks the state and then tries to undo it, undo the changes using these procedures basically. So to rephrase it, the basic idea is we, we break down the overall transaction into smaller steps. Then these steps can be performed in atomic transactions internally. They may, they may not, we don't really care. And Saga ensures that either the transaction, the whole thing completes fully or not at all. Let me just ask you, wake you up for a moment. Who has heard of the Saga pattern? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so it may be a surprise to some of you. It's not a new thing. It was originally published in 1987. Back then it was published to, uh, it was intended to solve an issue of long running transactions in databases. And luckily for us, it's quite a good fit for microservices nowadays. There are two main approaches to Saga. One could be called orchestration, which kind of provides a good way of controlling the flow, which services are called, how the rollback is handled. And there need it's called an orchestration because there needs to be an orchestrator, a single node which tells all the others which local transactions to execute. <coughs> the other approach is choreography, where there is no central coordinator, orchestrator or something. And all the services call each other and basically pass the state among themselves. So now we are going to the implementation part, that was the theory, and now we would like to present uh, the two approaches. First one me, and the second my, uh, 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 will present my colleague. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the first is a long running action, which is a specification uh, 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 in, uh, in development under microprofile uh, umbrella. It's mostly Java based and expect to provide the transaction uh, capability hand or handling the transaction for uh, Java transac for Java application written with the microprofile. But it's not limited just for that. Uh, we have uh, like generic API that could be used in any uh, like uh, Java application and up to it as it uh, runs over HTTP where the uh, context is passed in, in headers that could be adapted with uh, other, other languages as well that we wanted to show you later, but probably not because we have some technical troubles with our demo. And this implementation, the, our implementation of the specification is uh, 
uh, done in under the Narayana uh, Narayana Transaction Manager project, where we used the as uh, as the saga needs some lifecycle management. We use this uh, orchestration approach of having the LRA coordinator, which provides the rest endpoint, the where you can manage uh, transaction and let participants get the ideas uh, how how the uh, whole saga runs uh, and which what what, uh, what the state uh, is. On my side, uh, the project is called Dimeflow. It's a workflow engine written in Ruby. Uh, you can say workflow, you can say backend processing, whatever. And currently it is in use by the Foreman project. And it can do all sorts of stuff, stuff which are kind of out of scope of this talk, sadly. Just to give you a sneak peek, uh, it can run independent steps concurrently. It can pull external tasks and much more. Come to us, come talk to us after the talk and we can show you more. And uh, support for sagas was introduced there in the form of rescue strategy for execution plans. And it will start to make sense after a couple of slides. So uh, let's describe uh, Again, a bit like uh, the, the, the uh, like what's the difference between the, the these two approaches to these implementations. I start again with uh, our long running action. Uh, as I said, there is the LRA coordinator, which uh, uh, where the services enlist themselves, uh, and they are providing as well. That's um, responsibility of the service to provide some endpoint where the coordinated and called back to the service. Uh, we uh, usually expect there is some uh, request call where uh, the the service starts starts the uh, the LRA the, the saga and pass it this this uh, by call to LRA coordinator and enlist itself by providing the information where the endpoint stands and then uh, with, uh, the LRA coordinator provides the ID which this service can do take and pass to uh, other services in the chain where they can use it and as well if they will uh, and this themselves to, to, to the coordinator under the same uh, and does the same saga. Uh, then uh, at the end uh, the responsibility responsibility of LRA coordinators to call back to the services and inform them about the outcome uh, in this case, that uh, information is that confirmation means that uh, processing of the actions uh, was successful or were successful, and so the confirm is to call the callback to those services. On the Dimeflow side of things, uh, as I mentioned, Dimeflow originally started as a background processing engine, and because of that, it kind of shaped the way how the sagas are implemented there. So you can see the, the diagrams are kind of different. First, uh, the thing that is similar is that a request comes from a client. But it doesn't reach the service first, it reaches the executor first and tells the executor to do a thing. So the executor then knows how to perform the entire booking. It knows it has to book the flight and it has to book the hotel. So it makes a call to the hotel booking service and waits for it to finish. And then it makes a call to the flight booking service and waits for the, for the operation to finish. And when everything succeeds, it's done. There is no complete callback or something, because in our use case, usually the services we call don't really know their parts of something bigger. And we can, well, we could, but we don't, uh, go and change their code to handle their API endpoints and how they behave so it would better fit our use case. We just use all these other services the way they are. And for that reason, we need to do a bit of a 
paradigm shift, let's say. In our case, the executor has to know upfront the entire thing it has to do. It just has to know so it can track it and possibly undo it if something goes wrong. Compared to the LRA use case where all the parts are more involved, let's say. Now this was the happy path, how things go if everything goes smooth and all the reservations can be done. Next we have a sequence diagram of the, of the failure path, let's say. So I will take the um, explanation the, of, the, of the LRA uh, part. So that's the, again the same example with the two services which uh, one calls the other, but now the failure happens. So the uh, user calls the service. The service joins the, the saga by calling the LRA coordinator, and uh, meaning that providing the endpoint, the, the information where, where the uh, coordinator can call back. Uh, pro process some business, business operation, succeeds and passes uh, the call to the next service. Then next service again uh, uh, joins the saga here. And but the business business uh, processing fail fails. So uh, there is uh, information from the second service uh, about to to coordinator that the uh, saga should be cancelled or should be compensated, and then it's up to the coordinator to call compensate to all the services that were uh, that were uh, registered to the coordinator. So that's the, that's the sequence. On the dev side of things, again, the user calls the executor. The executor starts processing uh, an execution plan, as it's called in Dynflow, and it starts a first external task. It, it sends a request to the service one, and in this case, in this diagram, uh, the triggering is kind of synchronous, so it waits until the request, you know, until the request finishes, and we assume that by the time the request finishes, uh, everything is already done on the services side. But you could just take that start external task and succeeds block and replace it with trigger and external task and poll for status, for example. So it can operate in several modes, let's say, depending what fits your use case. Uh, for us, what usually happens is that we call another service which has its own tasking engine and we just kickstart another task there and when, then we poll for it to, and wait until it finishes. It would be unwise to wait with open TCP connection until it finishes, so we just poll. So back to this example. We start one external task and it succeeds. And then we call another service and for some reason it fails. So at that time we <coughs> stop processing of that execution plan and create an execution plan which should undo the changes done by the first execution plan. That's below the regard line and what we do is here we expect that the services have a compensate endpoint where we can tell them to undo the changes they did. So the executor calls first the second service and then it calls the first service. So it un undoes the changes in the reverse order than it made them in the first place. Now I, I come, I'm coming back to, to long running actions and uh, say a little more bit about uh, how it's used from the like, uh, uh, developer perspective. Again, just to recap, there is, uh, the, the service needs to provide the endpoints for the coordinator to know where to call back. And the uh, responsibility of coordinator is just to, uh, uh, to call those endpoints and uh, like guaranteeing the consistency in way of even some uh, network failures or the crash of the coordinator, the service knows that those uh, those endpoints will be will be called uh, uh, at some point in the end. 
the saga saga pattern is eventual consistent, meaning there is not set some precise timing, but just uh, you know that the the callback will be will be invoked. Uh, the uh, the LRA is set it's defined as a, as we are trying to uh, to get it being defined as micro profile specification, and here we de here we go with the two possible ways uh, how the developer can can um, manage the LRA, which is programmatic API and uh, uh, annotation annotations annotations comes uh, to be like similar to what the uh, JTA uh, JTA annotations in uh, uh, enterprise Java application provides just like to to change the uh, uh, the words to to be like LRA specific. So if you are like familiar, for example, with uh, ent Java enterprise uh, enterprise Java, then LRA could be thought as being like those. Uh, 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 annotations defining if uh, the uh, transaction should be is required or requires new. So, uh, already defined defined at the at the method uh, which is uh, rest endpoint start the saga and list the participants and uh, and the operations inside of the method is process uh, as uh, in the in the scope of that saga. Then the uh, then the developer uses uh, complete and compensate annotations, which again needs to be defined on s at some uh, at some rest endpoint, which informs the the, the uh, LRA client uh, library that those are endpoints which will be called back. Which, what I uh, didn't mention, this is like the um, API for the application developers. You need to pack. Uh, the client library with your application, which provides this API. Uh, I will just leave those other uh, annotation for your uh, bio interest. You can check the 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 specification, or you can talk then uh, then after the session about the details. Just mentioning here the programmatic API. The same thing could be done just by running the uh, the calls on the uh, the library where you can start and join uh, the saga uh, get this, the information about the status and about the just the what what the LRA coordinator knows about the uh, currently running uh, LRAs uh, as I uh, oops, sorry uh, I wanted to, to just to quickly show here the code example and just for a moment. Uh, is this large enough? Does everyone see it? Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Just uh, b m as we d don't have a demo running here, so that will be just the uh, show showcase of the code. I have here the like the simple service, like uh, which is called uh, booking, flight booking, and I the definition here is like to to having this uh, LRA annotation, meaning this method is running under scope of one LRA. Uh, I'm, I can say in which cases the LRA should be defined as the ca cancelled to be compensated um, based on the uh, HTTP uh, status codes. And then I like do some business logic, getting some matching flight. And as the, as the next step, I am passing the uh, the call I'm sorry here I'm passing the call to the next service okay uh, and this this next service gets the HT, the saga ID as a part of HTTP header uh, which is automatically pro provided by uh, a LRI client library so we just call the next service and this HTTP header is like uh, back into the into the header and the next service could use it. Uh, then the application developer defines like some complete and compensate uh, uh, method as it was set. And here the logic is uh, done in the way that during the LRA processing 
the uh, the business logic inserts uh, information about the booking is to be processed, so it set a uh, state like in progress, and during the complete or compensation that uh, the that state uh, that state in the database in change like for complete or cancelled. Uh, sure. What if compensate uh, actually fails? This even uh, co the, the, the the question was what happens when complete or compensate uh, fails? That's uh, like you are you are uh, you are sure that you will be called back uh, when that uh, that complete and compensate uh, really is uh, uh, that you 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 are ensure that you will that your endpoint will be called then. Uh, now depends on you what what you want to do. If you uh, if there is some failure and you you will uh, expose that failure back to the coordinator with some error code, then you are uh, you are ensured that you will be called back. Uh, up to time you will uh, you will um, confirm that the processing of the of that complete uncompensating method uh, was was successful. On on the other hand. If there is some uh, failure that you do not provide back to the coordinator, it's just up to you how you will handle it. It's kind of you will. It's hard to do how you will be do still like doing confirmation there and back. How when you will end? It's kind of the if I go to the kind of the, this consensus uh, academic stuff, this FLP problem that you never know where, where to end. So it's. You are ensured that you will be called back when you inform the coordinator there was a failure. If there is, for example, the error uh, error at the network, again the coordinator knows there was some crash, so something doesn't happen. But the coordinator does not know in if you were some somewhere in the middle of processing, and that's up to you how you will handle it. Normally, that would be said that there is some uh, asset trans could be done that there is some asset transaction that is run in, in scope of that particle microservice. And when the failure happens, that this asset transaction process, this consistency based on that particle part of code. If there is some crash, then you hope that uh, the asset transaction manager rollbacks the changes. And you will know that you will be called once again by uh, LRA uh, Saga, uh, LRA coordinator at, that, at your endpoint to finish uh, the, the completion or compensation once again. Does it respond? And, and if there is like a bug, uh, you have to uh, fix it before it can go through, so it will just call back and call back? Uh, yeah, no, there, there is like, uh, there, the, I'm currently not sure if how it's now done in our implementation, if there is some like, or maybe there's some proposal from specific specification. If there is, could be some limit, how how many times you will be called back? But in general, yes, that's uh, the similar thing. How the standard transaction manager works? He just tries to finish with consistency, and the transaction manager never knows what's happening on the other side. That's same uh, in case of the database. If there is. I can say that if there is some trouble in database providing a wrong error codes or something, then transaction manager is like doesn't know what's happening and trying to calling the rollback or commit uh, in, in in cycle up to time some something happens. That's point is this to to be locked to be in to be processed to some information. So again, you need to to have some tracing. Uh, on, on top of, of that processing. This is something that, that's like business logic and uh, that's uh, it's hard to, to manage by, by, the, by this pattern. Yeah. That, uh, I think that was all from, from me here on this. Okay. Uh, now a bit about downflow building blocks. I mentioned actions and execution plans and rescue strategies and whatnot. So maybe I should circle back and actually explain what those are. So the core concept in Dabflow is an action and it's a logical unit. It's a thing you want to be done. They have three phases, plan, run and finalize. Where, and actions can be composed. 
Usually that's the purpose of the plan phase, where you can, as a part of an action, you can plan another action. And this way you can split the thing you want to do into several smaller pieces, which are more, more manageable. And then you can have a single top level action, which just composes all these together and basically puts there the glue that holds the entire thing. Then we have execution plans, which are generated by planning actions. So the mental model is you have an action, you plan it, and when you start, it creates an execution plan, and all the others, all the other actions which are planned from inside that action, and its descendant actions, and their descendant actions, and so on, belong to that same execution plan. So for us, the execution plan is the scope of the transaction we want to do. Execution plans can have rescue strategies, or to be correct, actions can have rescue strategies. And these are then combined if something goes wrong. And we use that to determine what to do with an execution plan which failed. For example, we had pause where we would just stop the execution plan at that time when a failure happens and let the user investigate and for example try to do it again or skip the step that failed and just go over it and move on or just fail, just mark it as done, nope, not going anymore and we added the rollback or revert rescue strategy which implements the saga pattern basically and the last missing piece are steps which uh, are the units of work. They are the smallest item downflow can process. And to put all this into relation, you have an execution plan which has one entry action. It's the top level one. This action has three phases. It has to have one step in the plan phase and it can optionally have a single step in the run phase and a single step in the finalize phase. It's kind of complex to explain this without any real world example, so we'll just silently move on and hope it starts making sense we, when we see some examples. <coughs> this is an example action. First, we have a book hotel action which inherits from the downflow action class. It includes some kind of module, which is omitted, which does uh, HTTP calls and parses the response and handles all that. And then we define the run method. By defining a run method inside an action means we want this action to have a step in the run phase. We are omitting the plan step so it is inherited from the action class and the default behavior is just basically plan self which means that this action will be considered for processing in run and finalize phases and then to demonstrate the composability we have the book trip action <coughs> which plans five, five times the book hotel action so for example, we want to book a hotel and we want to make a reservation for five people, but they provide an API endpoint to only make a reservation for one person. So we just make it five times and be done with it. As I mentioned, sagas in Dynflow are implemented using rescue strategies for execution plan because for an execution plan, we know how all of its steps finished. And if we know how to undo every single of those steps, we can undo the entire execution plan because we, need, we know all the information we need to do it. So, to put it another way, you trigger an action that generates an execution plan. Ge execution plan gets executed, and if it fails somewhere along the way, we determine a correct rescue strategy. If that is revert, we create another execution plan which should undo the changes done by the first execution plan 
and then we execute the second one. Here we added uh, some changes to make the previous uh, example reversible, basically. The key points are we include the downflow action revertible module and we implement the revert run method. And that's all. That's all you have to do to go from the single action we create a booking to we create a booking and if something else fails somewhere down along the way, we can revert it. Yeah, we had a demo prepared, but somehow we missed an information about available connectors and <coughs> we can't really present it to you now. <clears throat> so uh, if you want, we'd be very glad to show it to you if you just stopped here uh, after we finish. I guess. <laughs> and the demo would show this thing. <laughs> Still the same. same Believe us. <laughs> same same uh, idea of communicating <coughs> to services or the executor pro processing to services. Uh, and if failure happens, it coordinator is capable to like call the compensator or revert the work. Right. So uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. to somehow finish the talk. Small summary. At least we believe the sagas are a great solution if you need transactions in microservice deployments. But as everything, they are not a silver bullet. So you're doing a trade-off. If you're willing to loosen your requirements and kind of sacrifice strict atomicity for eventual consistency, it's the way to go. Do you have any questions, anyone? Yes, please. Uh, there's three of you. So first, in the blue, please. You talk about compensation for the one-time action, but I'm curious what happens if the revert execution Uh, so the question is how it's handled in Dynflow if, uh, if an execution plan which is undoing changes made by the previous execution plan, how we handle if the second execution plan fails. Um, it's basically up to the developer who writes uh, the code for the actions. With it being Another execution plan, we can apply the same set of strategies and we can either pause it and wait for someone to handle it somehow, or we can fail that and, well, we failed, we couldn't undo it, and we're done. Or we can have a, res a revert for that and you can go down that rabbit hole and have reverts for reverts for reverts. If you want, you can. So the question was, uh, it can happen that an execution pl plan gets stuck in a post state and whether we have any plans to introduce some kind of timeouts to you know, provide a window for a user to fix it, is that correct? And uh, no, the, some, uh, I was more thinking about uh, auto fail because if you oh. get something in a post state for a very long time, it also creates a locks. Mm -hmm. some of the tasks which can get executed because of that? Uh, not yet, but it would be a great addition. <laughs> so feel free to add an issue to our issue tracker. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, please. What's the underlying storage for both uh, solutions? The question is what's the underlying storage for both of these solutions? So for Dynflow, we use a traditional relational database 
And we have support for SQLite, MySQL, and Postgres. Uh, and in case of uh, long-running actions, it is based on the uh, Narana, which is Firefly Transaction Manager. So it provides the storage issue which is implemented there, and that's currently uh, the file-based system, which is just the like some simple one, or the uh, uh, running uh, in uh, with the uh, uh, with the storaging uh, uh, as the active MQ as the logs are stored. So that's kind of the in better performance, but still it's uh, stored at the file system, and then uh, we provide as well the, the SQL, SQL database storage, uh, so you can basically uh, support all, all databases where the, the data could be, could be put to. Okay, so uh, the question is how we uh, manage uh, uh, the, the failure of uh, uh, coordinators, what will be done. Uh, in case of long-running actions, that's an issue. We know about it. We are working on the HA solution that could process this uh, in, in a way that there will be multiple uh, instances running and uh, will be possible to handle the, the, uh, the, the request uh, like in HA. So currently it's not, not available, but we hope it will be soon. With Dimeflow you can run multiple executors, which use the same database, so they see all the same data. And you can get some kind of fault tolerance, let's say, by doing that. But as always, if all the replicas die, you're done. So the question is if there are, the, when the, the LRA uses the REST endpoints, if you can uh, take your Python application and use it. Yeah, that, that's the idea uh, that the, the communication or, or HTTP uh, uh, REST endpoints should be, are defined or should be used, could be used, but this is like not directly uh, baked into the specification, but it's kind of the de dependent on the uh, implementation. So for our case of Narana LRA coordinator based on the Wi-Fi transaction manager, yeah, we provide the rest endpoints and defining the HTTP ways how you can communicate from whatever application. We have now the guys from Node.js which are thinking about to create the library which will be capable to uh, run uh, like as a part of, of the of our saga from Node.js application. But so I don't know, can mm -hmm. I, I just deploy LRA basically in its own from here without having the really other part of uh, Java EV basically literally just the JDA part. Yeah. There, the, the the point what the, the thing what you need is this LRA coordinator. This is the 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 service which provides the saga for the uh, your microservice uh, world. So yeah, you can just take this uh, LRA coordinator, put it to, to, microserv to, to the service. We, current, we are running with Tontail, which is uh, implementation of microprofile uh, stuff uh, from, from Red Hat. So you can just run one service, get it running somewhere, and that service provides the endpoint that you can use from your uh, other services and getting this uh, done, uh, that is run. Yes, you could say that. <laughs> Just the last thing for me. Uh, sorry, if you would be interested in the project, uh, check our uh, specification. You can join our community gitter or uh, other like the, the, the there are, there are the hangouts where we discuss the issues and uh, so you can you can join us. We hope that we will be with uh, 0 0.0 uh, version somewhere in the middle of this year. And I think we had one more question. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much.